to give a proper overview of the Harvard Five, as I mentioned before, obviously there were essentially um, four young followers of Marcel Breuer uh, uh, coming to the Fairfield County area, um, and therefore they became known as the Harvard Five. No one else has done a book on the subject, so I defer to Bill on this. But if you want to just launch in, or do you want me to do a little bit more intro? Well, I, I think the power up is, where is that? Is this on? Can you guys? Can, I, can you hear me? Oh, good. Stover, so, are you okay. on? Can you tell? Okay, so I, I think the, the, the Harvard Five were important to us as Americans because they were really the first wave the first generation to uh, uh, be schooled uh, in the Bauhaus style. So, uh, is the mic on? I think it's on. Yep. I think it's it sounds on. like it's on. Okay. It's on. So that they were they were important to to, to us because they were the first generation unleashed uh, here, um, uh, schooled in the in the new Bauhaus style. Everything up to then had been taught in the old Ecole de Beaux Arts style. So this was kind of a a shock to the, to the system here, even though it was not so much in Europe, it was to here. Um, and then when they, look, they, they, the primary reason they came to New Canaan is because of New York City. New York, New Canaan exists as it does because of its relation with New York City. Uh, however, when I spoke to a lot of the original homeowners, because so when I first started, a lot of them were still in the homes, uh, what struck me is a lot of them said, well, we came here because land was cheap. And it's, it's hard to imagine that now, because uh, okay. it certainly isn't now. But, and I almost dismissed it, that they would say that so, so casually. And, uh, but it, that wasn't so far out, uh, because uh, New Canaan was still quite rural then. There were still gentlemen farms. Um, and to, uh, to small farms, uh, if, if, it's not, if it's not economical to farm the land anymore, the land becomes a liability. It's just a tax liability. So. So land was relatively cheap, and the Merritt Parkway was relatively new, and that kind of opened up the northern parts of, of these towns. Now, to, to buy land in New Canaan, you'd still have to improve upon it to even start to build a house. You'd have to drill a well. You'd have to bring electricity in. You'd have to bring fuel in. So uh, the raw land might have been relatively cheap. Uh, so they, they um, but there was really the connection. New Canaan has that uh, spur railroad line it connects to Stanford and then goes right into New York City. So without that, I don't think it would have been developed as rapidly. So, um, but I want to get back to uh, what uh, Hillary mentioned about the inter international style. Uh, when I spoke to some of these architects and some of the homeowners, they, they still had a kind of a visceral reaction to, to Philip Johnson and, and even that book, The International Style, because because both words, because international and style. And a lot of them didn't see it as a style. They thought that something had fundamentally changed and, 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 and uh, you know, styles come and go. And this was not something that was gonna come and go, this was gonna you know, change everything. And I think both could be right, perhaps. Perhaps it is a style and perhaps it did change everything. Um, and what I, what I found interesting when I was doing my research uh, in town was that everybody had a reaction. The, the town was very divided. There were people who, even in the current, the present day, are, are so much against these houses. And there are people who are so much in love with them. And, and almost no one takes a neutral ground on this. And, and I, I, there's actually a series of letters to the editor uh, that were published in the local newspaper at the time. Uh, Philip Johnson had, had um, done a little speaking engagement at a Kiwanis organization okay, in town. And uh, the, the, the prior week, the newspaper um, had, had uh, in the letters to the editor, they, someone had wrote uh, um, a letter to the editor kind of making fun of, of Mr. Johnson and the other, and the other uh, Harvard Five how that they were spoiling the countryside. And uh, for some reason, the letter writer put it to rhyme, this letter to the editor. And, and then the, the architects had read this and felt a little affronted, I think. And so they responded, making fun of that person, 
uh, as kind of being too old fashioned. And they did it in rhyme. And then half the town seemed to join in. And everybody start, started writing letters to the editor, taking sides on the issue, and all doing it in rhyme. And so it was so interesting to me to see that kind of involvement, to see everybody was so excited and that there was battle lines drawn. And, and you know, I, I kind of wish that we still had that, uh, that level of excitement on, on what's happening now. Is there anything being built now that would get that kind of level of, of excitement from people? And so I, I found that era fascinating because of that. Now I think uh, when the, well, I'll start, I'll start with, with um, that. I think when they were, they were taught in, in, in Harvard, the Bauhaus style, uh, as I see it, it has this, has this um, aspect of kind of total design to it, that, that if you were to design something, any, every part of it, every detail of it should relate to the overall, overall. And so the, uh, every, like, like every detail would be a part of the DNA of the building. You could take any, and I think uh, um, Elliot Noyes, I, I published, a, I reprinted a, a quote from him where he said almost like, Every detail of the house should be like every grain of sand is to the earth. The DNA is in there that explains everything. And I think they, that's how, the, and it's very much a gropious idea, I think. And th there was an emphasis on efficiency and, and functionality. So, but what I find interesting is when they came here, they started building that way and then quickly expanded. And so they, it wasn't just about efficiency and compactness and, and the form follows function and this kind of machine for living in thing. It started to be much more inclusive. And I was surprised to find this. Um, and so I'll, even with Breuer's first house, you see it, the basic house is very compact, very efficient. And then there's this huge cantilever on one side. And that's the exciting part of the house. You know, that's the part of the house you see in the pictures, and that's what makes it very exciting. And so, uh, but that's not really form follows function. That's just, that's very exciting kind of thing, and it's, but it's both. So it has this compact design, and yet has this daring experimental cantilever. And I say experimental because it did fail. So, then you have Landis Gores. Well, what was he doing? So his first home was his, his home for himself, and it was a rather grand house. It was a rather large house. And... You, when you your, your first look at it, it seems very righty, kind of frankly rightish. But he's fusing right and Mies van der Rohe. So he, Landis Gores had been uh, uh, Philip Johnson's first business partner. And Johnson, and, I mean, uh, Gores had done really the drawings for the glass house, the detailing for it. So he was very schooled in Miesian and detailing. You see his own home, and it's a real combination of right and Mies, American and international. And I don't know anybody else really even attempting to do this. So it's another example of this and that. It's not just one thing. Um, look at John Johansson's work. John Johansson's first home for himself, a very modern, uh, compact home, very efficient. Then he started building for clients, and you see these series of, of nine square homes. And he, it's almost like a puzzle he's doing. And he later calls that his Neo-Palladian series. So it's modern and it's Palladian. So again, another example of its dual things. And uh, of course, Johnson being uh, a great example, look at the glass house. If you look at the plan, it looks very, mo very modern. It's kind of floating constructivist painting, uh, de uh, de steel kind of arrangement and plan. And yet the elevations, what you walk up to on all four sides are very classical. So it's kind of this duality, it's kind of schizophrenia almost. And so, um, Elliot Noyes, Elliot Noyes' first house, very compact, very efficient. His second house, a totally romantic idea. These two wings with a big courtyard in the middle, having his family walk between the wings out, almost outside in the weather. It's a very kind of less than practical idea very romantic idea. So again, it's this kind of duality, and I see this, and I think this is important because I think this is what, this is what they, how they were breaking ground. So New Canaan wasn't just another modern enclave, and there are plenty of modern enclaves throughout the US, 
but I think they were doing something almost unwittingly here that is the importance in the, in the big picture uh, because this this um, this theory of and that things could be two things this duality really wasn't even written down until the 1960s more more uh, like Venturi's work yeah. and things it really wasn't even more officially recognized until the 70s so I think this is they're doing this in 1948 1949 so I think they were a good 15, 20 years or more. Ahead of their time. Ahead of the time. Absolutely. And not that they even, not that they even recognized it. I'm not sure they even uh, elucidated it. They were just kind of doing it. Very good. Bill, thank you so much. I think mm -hmm. just because Natasha was wishing my ear that we are only have so much time, even though I wish we had all morning. So with that, I so appreciate those remarks. Stover, maybe we we'll go to you next, if we may, just to have you talk a bit about, about Johnson. Um, Great. Um, first, I want to say Hillary said that uh, she wanted to be more like Terry. Yeah. And in my next life, I want to be more like you, Hillary. Oh, my God. So, we go back so about it, well, quite a amazing. few years. I don't know how she can speak speak so naturally. It's great. I've got yeah. Philip whispering in my ear. <laughs> so I'm actually going to read this. Um, oh. Well, let's see if we can get Is it, it working? Get it working. Let's see. Okay. It's closer. Closer? That's better. better? Okay, thank great. Thank you. So thank you, Hillary and, and Natasha. And thank you, Terry, in advance for illuminating how Philip Johnson came to fall in love with modern architecture. Socrates said, with love, poetry follows. And Dylan Thomas said, a good poem helps to change the shape and the significance of the universe. And I think what Bill was just talking about, the uh, Harvard Five made the, a contribution. My co-author David Money and I, with architectural historian Neil Levine, examined all 70 of Johnson's houses. 30 were built. I have a few starting remarks about what Hillary covered and what Terry will probably cover, but they're important to the houses. And uh, when, when Alfred Barr asked Johnson, just out of college, to head up the Department of Architecture and Design at the fledgling MoMA, he said, I don't know anything about architecture. Barr said, you will. <laughs> at MoMA, he learned modern architecture. He traveled, got to know and see the work of the great modern masters, including Frank Lloyd Wright, Korb, and Mies. He saw Mies's Tugend Hot House, Le Corbusier's Villa Savoy, and in 1931, he described in the magazine T-Square Mies's one-story Berlin building exposition house, describing walls of glass and how it included part of the garden within its walls. We know about Johnson's walls of glass. Forty of his houses were courtyards. He also described how it defies photography, and only by walking it can its beauty be obtained. These designs, and the fact they were bold and not timid, had a decisive impact on Johnson's future houses. Johnson enrolled in architecture school at Harvard in 1940 and was excused from the modern architecture history class because he wrote the text. His, his first school project called an architect's study was, in effect, a glass house for himself. It had walls of glass and a large masonry indoor-outdoor fireplace rising from a masonry platform. His thesis was his first built house and for himself. Opposite of the glass study, it was a walled Mesian courtyard. And it launched a lifelong dialogue with the public about the architecture before he even had the license. It was published widely and included in, a, in an exhibit at MoMA in 1944. Philip Johnson started his practice in architecture in 1945. Suddenly he had three occupations at once. Architect for his house clients, architect and client for his own new Canaan house, and MoMA curator, pulling together MoMA's seminal Mies exhibition of 1947. He never stopped juggling these three. 
Johnson designed and built his glass house 1945 to 1949. From the simple point of view of program, it started and stayed a typical three bedroom house with a place to park the car. How it functions and is composed change in extreme ways. It's divided into two pavilions separated by 75 feet of gravel walkway. One pavilion is totally transparent, the other totally opaque, except for three five foot diameter portholes. To correct a popular misconception, the idea of a glass house was not Mies van der Rohe's or Phillips, despite Johnson crediting Mies for the idea of a glass house. There were three glass houses in America before, Buckminster Fuller's 4D Dymaxion in 1927, and Chicago's George Keck's House of Tomorrow, House of Glass in 1933, and his Crystal House in 1934. After selection of a beautiful Connecticut site, there were two critical moments in the design of the glass house. The first, creating one unit on the prow overlooking the view, and one unit pulled back, freeing the first one for 360 degree views. Preliminary designs of the glass house were two or three masonry blocks grouped together, forming a court on the prow where the glass pavilion is now. If you want to see what this scheme looked like, see Johnson's House for a Millionaire with No Servants from exactly the same time. Or see me after, we can take a look <laughs> at it. In 1993, Dave and I were with Johnson when he said about the group of blocks, this is all as if I hadn't realized the potentiality of the site as a single mound with a single unit on it that looked in all directions. By March 1946, he pulled everything off the prow except for one standalone box and made its walls glass. The second critical moment was creating the cylindrical brick chimney, the only enclosed space in the glass pavilion, pulling out the kitchen to create a minimalist cylinder. This gave extreme see-through transparency. It took one year and eight months to reach the transparency Johnson wanted. It became one-third the obstruction of the Farnsworth House core. When Frank Lloyd Wright visited the house later, he said, am I inside or out? Should I take my hat off or leave it on? Right on. He obviously achieved his objective. Juggling, fireplace, bath, and kitchen, the core began as a large S-shaped spiral core, then split into three cylinders with different diameters with fireplace. Then the cylinders were reduced to two. Finally, Johnson pulled out the kitchen, shrinking the core to just 10 foot diameter and integrating the fireplace and bathroom. It appears as a monumental cylindrical brick fireplace rising from a matching brick floor. Johnson called the brick cylinder the motif of the house. In 1993, looking at design drawings with Philip, he said the following to my co-author Dave and me. Yes, I had no idea. I changed my program. I had a kitchen, and then I didn't have a kitchen. Well, I remember making these. I remember making a model about this time. I made a model with just the two cylinders, and that was too big, and the three were cluttered. I mean, what would you do in that space? It got so crowded with these great big cylinders glaring at you. The minute I made that model, I realized. Then looking at the final single cylinder, he said to us, yes, when I got to the turn, once the space was curling around it, I was much more pleased. Not having the kitchen indoors, that was a big decision. The hearth anchoring to the ground, you're not the first to point it out. Mies, that's why he lifted the plane off the ground. I put a house on the ground where God meant it to be. I asked Johnson, what did you think? You know, when did you think that the glass house had become something very special in American architecture? He said, oh, when I got to the round chimney. See, I recognized what Mies would think. He did, how awful it was and how delightful it actually was. Landis Gores, Phillips' associate, drew up Phillips' designs and built the models. He wrote in his unpublished memoirs, 
bravest of decisions was elimination of the smaller cylinder with his fireplace. We worked out instead a single drum holding a fireplace carved out of the face sector diagonally opening to the sitting group. Four doors to the landscape walk out any side onto the lawn and a cylinder core, powerful yet reduced, allow the landscape to flow through the house. Philip said to us, the house was just a trick to make landscaping. That house doesn't exist for me. It's where I stand and the landscape goes on in all directions. Bravo. Great. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stover, thank you. I think that's that was fabulous. Thank you very, very much. I answered some of the earlier and it's also it's about, great because yeah. you're going to now that's a bit of a preface for you to have in your mind as you're going to visit the glass house this afternoon. Again, I'm going to bring us back just because we're responsible for talking about the entirety of the Harvard Five. So mm -hmm. if I can throw it to John, maybe you want to talk a little bit about Mr. Breuer and the fact. And it just, I don't know if I mentioned everything properly, I probably didn't, but John, uh, uh, early on in his architectural career, worked for the successor firm to Marcel Breuer, so is extremely familiar with the work of Breuer. Yeah, so what really led to my, my particular um, interest in modern architecture and uh, eventually my interest in getting involved in Docomomo and helping to try to preserve it and educate people about it was going to work uh, exactly 20 years ago now for Herbert Beckard who was one of uh, Breuer's uh, partners and design collaborators, and uh, uh, turns out uh, particular interest perhaps to this group, he was the partner with whom Breuer designed uh, the most uh, of his houses uh, during the period that Herb worked for him, which began in 1951. Herb actually volunteered. He worked initially for free. He said he would have had to, had to pay money to go to Harvard, but uh, he could, uh, for, for nothing, work for Breuer, learn from him, uh, worked with him, uh, became his partner in 1964 at the same time that uh, Robert Gatchy, who recently passed away, and Hamilton Smith became Breuer's partners. And uh, they all practiced with Breuer until he retired. Um, and um, But Herb was led to architecture by seeing Breuer's Geller House, 1946, in Lawrence, Long Island, which was his hometown. Uh, it's an interesting thing. you know. Uh, many architects will point to a single building that they saw that was sort of the epiphany building and um, that led them to want to become an architect and that was uh, that building for Herb. Um, he was actually not one of Breuer's students, studied at uh, engineering at Penn State, um, uh, did a year uh, in the architecture uh, graduate program at Princeton which didn't particularly agree with him and um, ended up uh, working for, uh, for Breuer. But um, Herb and Breuer together worked on approximately 30 houses, um, including later a second one for, for Bert Geller in Lawrence, Long Island. Um, but many of those are documented in the book Architecture Without Rules, uh, written by David Masello with a, a good bit of input from Herb, uh, published by W.W. W. Norton in 1993. Um, I pulled out my, my copy uh, before this, uh, have a look at it. And, uh, saw the, the uh, inscription in the copy that Herb gave me to John Arbuckle, my trusted lieutenant and good friend, which was quite heartwarming to see. Um, Herb passed away in 2003 at the age of, of 77, rather suddenly um, at age 77. He had been a very vigorous um, man of his 70s, very energetic, and uh, sort of prided himself on that. It was, was a champion tennis player. But um, um, after Breuer retired, um, Beckard and the other partners continued as MBA, um, but um, that uh, really didn't continue to run very smoothly. So Herb and Frank Richland, who was the senior associate in the Breuer office, left to establish their own firm. And um, uh, some of the work that they did was to uh, renovate and expand Breuer buildings. Uh, in their practice, they carried on very much uh, loyal to the, to the spirit of modernism. Um, they uh, were very hostile uh, toward postmodernism. And um, uh, some people say that perhaps they, they, uh, uh, they remained a bit overly uh, loyal to, to Breuer's ideas in their own designs and, and perhaps could have done more to find an independent voice. Um, but, uh, but regardless, uh, they were certainly very loyal to their, uh, to their master. Um, but among two of the projects that they worked on that are of particular interest here, um, uh, they expanded uh, and renovated two 
of Breuer's houses here in New Canaan, um, the houses that Breuer designed for himself. Um, Breuer's, uh, it's a little confusing. People often refer to it as Breuer One, but in fact, it's really Breuer's second house. Breuer One, in my mind and many others, was the house that he designed for himself uh, in Lincoln. Uh, uh, some of you will be going to see the Gropius house in Lincoln. Um, uh, Breuer's house that he designed for himself is just just right a, a stone's throw away from that. Um, but uh, his first house here completed 1948, the one that uh, Bill referred to with that ambitious cantilever that uh, never did uh, quite work, uh, as, actually as part of Herb's uh, expansion to that house uh, for Peter and, uh, and uh, Trudy Robeck uh, in 1986. Um, he actually put a, a field stone wall under a portion of it to um, uh, to make it uh, more uh, more stable, uh, which it never really was. Um, in addition, uh, Herb expanded um, in a couple of phases uh, the house that Breuer uh, built for himself after that. Breuer actually didn't occupy that house, which is on Sunset Hill Road, that uh, house of 1948, for all that long. Um, as Bill mentioned, it was a rather compact house, um, not that large. Um, Breuer's family was 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 expanding. I think his uh, his business was was prospering. Um, so he built uh, what sometimes referred to as here in New Canaan referred to as Breuer II, but technically really Breuer III in 1951. The West Road House um, Herb expanded that with a um, uh, a children's bedroom wing. Uh, I believe it was 1982, as well as uh, the Pool and Pool House. Uh, Toshika Mori subsequently uh, expanded that house uh, and actually removed the, the Beckhard bedroom addition. Um, so her wing is on the site of that, uh, that Beckhard addition, uh, but his pool and pool house remains. Um, Breuer also designed two other homes here in New Canaan. Um, the Niffen house, which he designed during his brief partnership with Elliot Noyes. Um, as well as the Mills House, which was uh, on Sunset uh, 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 Hill Road, right next door to his own house. Both of those houses uh, are, are, have been demolished, um, which does bring us to the matter of, um, of preservation here. Uh, sadly, many of the important modern houses that have been built in New Canaan uh, have been lost over the years, demolished, and some um, altered to the extent that they are unrecognizable. Um, in addition to the Breuer houses, which have been lost, um, four of the Elliot Noyes houses he designed independently, as well as the Niffen house he designed with Breuer, have also been lost. Is that number correct, Fred, as far as you know? Yeah. Um, and, I, and four of John Johansson's houses in New Canaan have also been lost, sadly. Uh, Johansson, in particular, has a awfully bad luck having his his buildings demolished, his great masterwork, the Mummers Theater demolished some years ago, his Morris Mechanic Theater in Baltimore demolished just a couple years back. John, I'm just, I'm, sorry, forgive me I'm for sorry if I'm rambling on too much. No, 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 not that you're, no, I'm just, right. you raised the issue of John Johansson, and I realize ter terrible oversight on my part not to have us address John's work a little bit more directly, so I'm glad you're bringing that up. Um, Natasha whispered in Meyer that we only have about 10 minutes to wrap up because Terry's okay. on the line, but nonetheless, okay. no, but I'm, let's, can we talk a little bit about actually the diversity among the group? I mean, to me, John Johansson kind of is his own thing. I don't know whether that is what led to the fact that so many of his works are not, no longer extant, but whether or not it's just that they, they're a little harder to understand. And Stover, you and I met with John Johansson. Do you remember? when we had lunch with John Johansson in New York. It's amazing the longevity of many of the Harvard Five, um, especially John, Johnson and Johansson. Maybe it's New Canaan. Maybe it's just New Canaan. The air in New Canaan. Stick around. Maybe you want to buy a house. Inger, are you here? Can you sell some houses to some people? Inger's right there. There's a few fabulous moderns for sale right now. Um, seriously, but I'm just you know, I'm thinking about that. And Bill, maybe you want to chime in on this. But John, you too. Um, I remember just, I, I asked uh, uh, I asked John Johansson once uh, how he felt about his, his house is being torn down, and, and he said, oh, it's like losing a child. Oh, it's so hard to see a house torn down. And I said, John, well, what if I told you that uh, you know, a young couple that just bought one of your houses, they're going to tear it down, but they want to hire you to design a new one. He goes, oh, well, that's different. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's sort of like the Philip Johnson line. What's your favorite project? He said, the next one. 
Absolutely. No, but it's interesting because we, we sometimes glom these guys together almost as though they're some unified group. And it's not the case. I mean, there's so, and you're going to hear much more, of course, about the work of Elliot Noyes when, when Fred speaks, um, uh, that there are distinct aspects. And again, maybe I'll throw it back to you too, Bill, because of your ability to kind of just see the whole thing. But all three of us, or excuse me, all four of us, uh, to speak about that. I mean, John, do you want to kind of address that? I'm, I'm opening it up to all three of you. I mean, the, the, the Harvard Five to me was just a catchphrase. It yeah. really was, because there, cause there yeah. were a great number of houses by other architects in town. Right. Uh, in fact, some of the le lesser known might have been better works than some of the better known. Can you all hear folks. Bill right now? Uh, okay, good. So, so like uh, John Black Lee did a yep. whole series of homes there. Of course, there's a Frank Lloyd Wright house in, in, in New Canaan. There is Toronto, which I believe you're seeing. Are they? I think you're seeing it today, tomorrow. Excuse me, tomorrow. Yeah, so, so the, it is. It's unfair that there, there are there are others outside who aren't as recognized, perhaps. Yes. And I and I hope to actually in the future to bring more recognition yes. to other other of those. We have, I believe, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, Bill. Approximately about a hundred still existing modern homes, or is it a little unclear? You know, the Glass House actually, in years ago, uh, initiated a project to document all of the the moderns uh, and, and to help, of course, then uh, support preservation efforts concerning these. And there was a bit of a challenge, in part because they're all privately owned. Many of the owners, understandably, are not really keen on having all these students showing up from whether it be from Columbia, Yale, or from anywhere around the globe. Um, so they were not as keen for us to publish a, uh, a map showing where everything is. But there is a need, I think, for the recognition and support, exactly what all of us here are really assembled to, to consider. How do you um, make sure that these things are preserved and that they are used into the future? Um, but John, maybe you want to talk about that as from the Docomomo side, or um, it's 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 certainly very challenging. Um, and Docomomo has been involved here since uh, at least uh, at least two thousand and one, and and actually we were involved in doing some of the initial survey work in conjunction with the uh, the New Canaan Historical Society that that was built upon to do the survey you're referring to, which was uh, completed in in two thousand and eight. Um, but, um, and as a result of that, um, there have been a number of properties placed on the National Register. Um, interestingly, there was, a, there was a, a, a multiple property listing in 2010 of, of 12 houses. Um, but, uh, so that uh, is certainly positive. There are a number of individual houses, including Landis Gore's house, are, are individually listed on the National Register. Of course, the Glass House is a National Historic Landmark, um, but we, we, we can assume that the Glass House is pretty well, uh, pretty safe. Um, but National Register listing really doesn't provide a lot of protection. So uh, it, it really just comes back to, to uh, with these homes, just finding owners who really want to be good stewards uh, for the houses. It's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's tough. There, of course, there are easements in certain cases. Some people have placed their homes under easement. I believe the, the Hodgson House is among yes. those where there, there has been uh, an, an easement uh, established. Which means, a, 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 in terms of, for those perhaps unfamiliar with this, that uh, there is a legal protection. So the Hodgson House, which is designed by Philip Johnson, located just across the street from the Glass House, um, that it cannot be torn down. It is, and fortunately, is in the hands of uh, wonderful owners who are great stewards of the site. And they may already be here. Yes, Craig and Scott are here, who are going to be speaking to you a little bit later about that. Um, but there are, that's a great, great challenge is how do you preserve these? And I think the, a classic problem, which I think is just almost crazy to think about, is that tastes have changed so much. As much as everyone says they love mid-century modern, they want larger bathrooms, they want a larger kitchen. There's a classic problem in places like Palm Springs where they'll say, oh, it's a great, great house, but we've got to tear out the kitchen and the bathrooms and we've got to change uh, the scale of things. So it is an interesting thing that we live our expectations of living are a little different today, and yet we are so in love, in many respects, with the aesthetics of what was done at mid-century. So it's an interesting combination. Just to warn you, I've gotten a little uh, note in my ear that we have about three to five minutes to wrap up. Mm -hmm. I think Natasha is ready for me to just step aside. <laughs> is it time to tell a quick story? Oh, God, I hope so. Yes, I want. Do you okay, guys agree? I'll, we need to have time for a story. All right, I'll try sure. to be quick. Um, when we were working on inventorying Johnson's houses, 
I was I was searching to find one called the uh, Leonard House, and it's a it's a, sort of a it's a, actually it was an incredible house. It followed quickly after the glass house, and Johnson reconfigured the the glass house piece with sort of the guest house piece where there's a uh, glass glass beam shooting off into a view over Long Island Sound. A it's, crazy cantilever. It's, it's a famous, yeah. beautiful photo by Esto. But anyways, I was trying to find it, and I, I was talking to Philip one day, and I said, you know, where is it? And he said, well, I don't remember exactly. You'll find it out in Long Island. Long Island. It's in Lloyd Harbor. We, Two minutes. We, we, it's quick. The governor gave us a okay. reprieve. We've got 10 minutes. Oh, okay. All right. That's, well, that was my I'll note over there. It out a no, time. no, we've got plenty but, more to talk about. But, Thanks, Dover. But, but anyways. Uh, I, Five? I uh, Nine. Okay. This is precision. I feel like I'm on a Swiss train. My goodness. <laughs> yes. I, I drove out to find the house. I, I couldn't find it. So I went down to the shoreline to see this thing come shooting out. I thought I'd find it. I looked up, and I was horrified because I saw a cantilevered, a cantilevered colonial shooting out towards the view. I walked up the hill, and a gentleman came out, and he said, you know, you could get shot wandering around here. And he was, he was the owner who had rehabilitated <laughs> the house because he needed much more space. But I, was, I, I actually met with him. We hung out <laughs> in his living room. And I was very careful to stay extremely silent about any judgments. <laughs> he, he colonialized it. Yes. Boy, that says it all, doesn't it? My goodness. No, but we so, have to, we're, we're, we're allowed to keep talking. We've. we've Okay. We're in good shape. I mean, just, just, I think, just zooming out a bit yeah. um, uh, and going back to the sort of the importance of of Gropius and Breuer at at uh, GSD. Um, in addition to the 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 uh, uh, the Harvard Five here in New Canaan, um, a, a number of the most prominent American architects of the of the post war era were students of theirs at that time. Ed Barnes, class of 1942. Paul Rudolph, class of 47, Ulrich Franzen, class of 48, I am Pei, Henry Cobb, Victor Lundy, Harry Seidler, who went on to become the most prominent modern architect in Australia. And by the way, did the, he was the one who did most of the drawings for Breuer's uh, first house here. Um, Bob Geddes, Hugh Stubbins, John Carl Warnicke. I mean, so it's really pretty, I mean, pretty extraordinary. That, that's, it's really uh, pretty much a, a who's who of, of American post-war architecture, all of those folks educated by Gropius and, and Breuer at, at GSD in that era. It's, it's really pretty extraordinary. Bill, I mean. Getting, getting back to the, the preservation of these homes, you know, I'm, I'm not sure all the homes were, were built uh, to, uh, to last, that, to last long. that long. I mean, the, 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 some houses had different programs, different budgets than others. Yes. And if your materials are not going to last, you know, more than 50 years, the house might be in bad shape. Part of the appeal, the part of the visual appeal to these houses, when you do a quick walkthrough, is it's a bit of a fantasy to live so Spartan a life. Yes. And, and suburban life is not this way now. You know, we are, uh, I mean, you, if you have children, you're going to have a stroller. You're going to have these things that take up space. And a lot of these homes have no space for these things. Right. It's just not. We, the program has changed for a reason. We've been you know, litigated into this position in some cases. You, yes. you have to have a car seat in your car. You're going to have all these things now. Bill, by the way, you know, is an architect who has worked on restoring uh, modern homes, so knows exactly what he's speaking about. No, so, please continue. So, I mean, I remember when I gave a presentation after the book came out, and, and a local preservationist came up to me and said, oh, we want you to be the, our, our figurehead to, 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 for, to preserve all these modern houses. And I said, I, I'm, I'm the wrong person. You know, I, I, I don't believe they should all be preserved in amber. Mm. Yeah, and, and I'm not sure that was even the intent when they were designed to, yeah. to, to freeze them. And would the architects have want them, wanted them frozen? Shouldn't they be able to adapt? Isn't that a more modern idea to let things adapt? Yes. I mean, it's, it's fascinating to hear you say that because, again, trying to channel what would Philip Johnson say, that there was a a time and place for all of this. Johnson used to joke about the glass house itself, that it was a 1920s house, because he was referencing the ideas of Mies van der Rohe of the 1920s. And the question would be, 
what do you do now? And he didn't continue to design in that way, but of course was criticized heavily because there are many out there who preferred the work that he did uh, in the 1940s and 1950s. But I think you're raising an important issue, which is how do we design today? And are there certain aspects, obviously, of what was developed then that we can continue to innovate from? So I think that that's it's maybe a kind of a bigger you know, core issue um, that architects are facing today. Stover, do you want to take a little bit of that on? I mean, you're a practicing well, no, architect. It just, it just occurred to me, there is, you're bringing up the other side of the equation. You have the architect, and then you have the client, or someone who actually wants the house made or live in it. And it's just a, it's a yeah. fascinating side. Um, researching this book, uh, we're really fortunate to speak with, we're extremely fortunate to speak with maybe four or five of Johnson's clients. And uh, they're, they're since gone. But it was fascinating. These people were incredibly dynamic. They were entertaining. They had amazing uh, insights. Um, they weren't just a passive client. And that was, that was really something. Yeah, part of, the, part yeah. of the clientele has changed. New Canaan has changed. So the clientele in New Canaan has changed. Let's I, talk I, about that. I, I remember I talking to a group and, and I was saying, I was puzzled by the fact that it seems like in, in, a, in, a, in a previous time that would have been a more conservative time that these were built and now in a more progressive time that were more conservative. And, and, and an older lady in the front row said, oh no, you got it all wrong. See, back then New Canaan was full of artists and writers and musicians and even the people in business were in marketing and things and it was a different clientele. So, yeah. The, I believe Mr. Riley is being delivered digitally. No, 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 wait a second. I'm sure Tara will wait for us to just, just finish up for a second. I, Bill, thank you so much for making that, uh, th that important comment. I want to thank all of you for, uh, Don, do you have anything last that you would like to discuss? Again, I, I urge you as you do the tours this afternoon and tomorrow to kind of think about maybe so, some of the things that we've raised. But it is a fascinating issue is how do you preserve these? That will be the, our, our next time that we all gather, perhaps, to really talk about those challenges. Because it is a challenge half a century or more down the pike. How do you preserve these things if indeed they were designed with such innovation that they might very well not last more than 50, 60 years? But we'll, we'll have to address that next time. I know we have much more we would have loved to discuss, but my understanding is that Mr. Riley is available electronically. Do, should I? Do we, are, we, are we ready over there? Do you need us another minute or so? It's kind of a perfect segue because we're talking about, I think I see Mr. Riley. Terry, if you can hear, Terry Riley. And Stover, thank you. John, thank you. Bill, thank you.